Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Housing has been the number one issue, I think, uh, you know, across Canada, uh, certainly in southern Ontario, and and as well in this uh, Mississauga mayoralty campaign that's ongoing right now. Uh, a very impressive gentleman I've had the privilege of chatting with before, Alad Ab Irwath, who is the Deputy Chief Economist at the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, uh, has joined us again to say sort of where we are and what's happened. Uh, um, sir... When we last chatted, uh, you know, you were describing to me how we needed, uh, I think it was 3.5 million uh, additional homes over and above what was otherwise going to be produced uh, in Canada, uh, 1.5 or 1.8, I can't remember the number, I think your number was 1.8 for Southern Ontario and the Premier's number is 1.5 million. Um, since then, we've had, you know, the federal government come out with numerous different proposals in the federal budget. Uh, we've had a decline in pre-construction condo sales of, I think, 71% in the first quarter of this year. Uh, we've had interest rates that uh, lots of people were hoping would come down that so far haven't come down. And we've had a real estate market that is so sort of topsy-turvy uh, that many people are telling me nothing's happening. And lots of people are you know, trying to get assignment sales done of their previously uh, purchased pre-construction condos that are now coming to completion. Lots of developers, I'm told, are applying to CMHC for for uh, financing to convert what they were thinking would be um, condos into rental housing. Seems like the market is in a really, really tough place. And if anything, it's gotten worse, not better. What do you think, sir? There's a lot of things to unpack in what you just said, but I, I think I agreed with almost all of it. it, it it's a very... Um uncertain difficult situation the the uh the demand for new construction uh, has not gone away uh, our estimates of, of how much needs to be built um continue to ratchet up uh with population and economic growth so um we have a huge demand for 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 new construction um but the means of achieving that are becoming more difficult um the regulations are starting to be changed, but but the, there's still a lot of regulations in place. Um, construction costs have gone up significantly, and maybe they haven't grown so much in the last year or two, but they are at high levels. Uh, workforce is difficult to obtain. Um, and then we have all of the various impacts of high interest rates. Um, you mentioned a few of them, so some difficulty in um, closing of sales on condominiums. There's been so many lags in the system that people may need to requalify to get a mortgage on, on the units actually built. So they may have put a deposit down five or six years ago, and, and things have taken a long time, and now the, the condo is actually built, and but they, the original mortgage may no longer be valid, and, and so they, they need to re-qualify, obviously, at higher interest rates. So there's a lot of noise around that. We we don't have precise data on it, but, but there's a lot of question marks. Um, a lot of uh, individuals have obviously um, purchased housing units, condos, townhouses, whatever, um, with the intent of renting them out, generating an income. Uh, but they would have borrowed money for that. And obviously with higher interest rates and mortgage renewals at higher interest rates coming around the corner, the, there may be quite a few uh, units now being sent into the market because households, uh, those investors are, are having a hard time covering their interest costs. Uh, and then there's sort of the big um, impact of interest rates on construction financing so when uh, developers want to build housing um, they they have their plans they get everything lined up and then they borrow money in order to finance construction and that borrowed money is then paid back later through either renting units out or selling those units so construction loans are, are quite an important mechanism to get uh, housing built and, and obviously now with higher interest rates uh, getting those construction loans is more difficult um, as you said um, there there are people moving from condominium construction to rental construction uh, and, that, and there are extensive cmhc 
uh, programs in that area. And so there is a lot of reliance on, to use the the names is programs like MLI Select that, that, that lead to, um, that support construction of, of rental units. And there's another um, program now, uh, the apartment construction program. I, I haven't remember, memorized the new acronym for it. Um, but uh, the, the, there is heavy use made of these programs to support construction. Um, but clearly there are challenges in construction because of higher interest rates and the difficulty in getting construction financing. So what do you think? Are we in a worse situation today or a better situation today? Um, the, the part that I'm getting more optimistic about is that the policy debate has shifted over the last two or three years. So going back a while, um, the, a, a lot of the um, importance of supply was, was you know, a little bit poo-pooed. Uh, there was a lot of discussion of, of demand um, that investors were, were um, promoting demand and so forth. So I, I think what's um, important and uh, a little bit optimistic at the moment is that the policy debate has shifted to we need to increase housing supply and, and it, it, that is the critical issue. So there's been a change in the debate um, towards, okay, well, how do we actually increase supply? Do we have the workforce? Do, is, what are the impacts of regulation and what can various orders of government do to promote supply? So I, I think the policy debate is moving in the right direction. I'm not 100% sure whether they understand uh, the scale of the challenge. So, I mean, we are talking about doubling housing starts to meet, uh, to get back to affordability. And so th this is no... Doubling. Uh, Doub we need a doubling in housing starts. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is not a small endeavor. Uh, so it, it, it's a systems change. It, it's not an extra house here, an extra house there, or you know, putting in a laneway house here or whatever, it's it, it's a systems change. Um, so I, I think there is understanding now that we have a supply problem, um, but I don't know that the there's an understanding of the scale uh, of the challenge. So th that that's the um, optimistic view at the moment. Coming back to then, you know, whether your question or whether we are worse off, I, I think we... Um, I'm not sure that we've completely um, weathered the impact of higher interest rates. Um, the, as I said previously, higher interest rates have an impact on construction financing and, and getting stuff built. Uh, we thought, past tense, that this would have an impact uh, in 2023 uh, and 2024 because interest rates started going up in 2022. That did not really happen at, at the scale that we imagined. Uh, what seems to have happened is that those higher interest rates had an immediate impact on um, small structures, single detached. So um, townhouses, the, the, those sorts of structures really fell, um, starts construction of, of those types of um, buildings fell in 2023, um, but the apartments carried on getting built uh, in Vancouver and Toronto. And the um, but our interpretation now is that we're just seeing a delayed effect of higher interest rates. There were pre-sales of those condos that were you know 2021, 2020. So th those condos were going to go ahead regardless in in 23, 24. Uh, but it, it's now that we're getting to the crunch on the um, the high interest rates impact on housing supply of these large structures is going to be felt probably in 24, 25. Um, so we're, we're a little bit pessimistic. We may be wrong, uh, but we're a little bit pessimistic on the rate of construction of these large buildings um, this year and next. Um, and this is what we need. We, we, we need that housing supply at scale. Um, we need a lot of these apartment structures, rental, ownership, whatever. Uh, but we need it at scale, uh, and um, I'm a bit concerned that in the short term, um, there's going to be a supply crunch uh, 
shall we say, through this year and into next. I'm uh, I'm convinced there's going to be a supply crunch, and uh, and I don't think you're going to get the changes at scale because I think that too many politicians are only focused on the the small uh, infill, uh, you know, fourplex or uh, or or other kinds of issues. But maybe we can uh, attack some of those issues after a break. We're going to take a message break. We're going to be back with the deputy chief economist at CMHC, Aled Ab Irawath, in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Back in two. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Aled Ab Irwath. He is the Deputy Chief Economist at the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC. I've had the, the pleasure of chatting with him before. Uh, maybe we could, uh, Aled, uh, talk through some of the issues that uh, we talked about in the, in the opening segment. Uh, you said that people are finally coming to terms with the supply issue, that they you know, historically were blaming it all on demand, and now they're coming to realize, at least policymakers, that it's a supply issue. Uh, and and regulation. Let me ask you about that, if I could. You and I spoke, I think it was about a year ago, about a CMHC stats can study that you did that suggested that uh, that some major cities in Canada um, had extremely slow approval processes, review and approval processes, and that that was damaging to development uh, because of the time period that uh, a developer took. Uh, to get approval, uh, the interest clock that kept on uh, building during that time period, uh, and the risk associated with actually getting approved. And uh, and you indicated that that had to or should change. Um, I'm aware of a study that's come out recently um, about Austin, Texas, that uh, reduced the uh, approval time period by 50%, and it dramatically increased uh, supply. Developers rushed in because they could make their money uh, far quicker, and, and you know IRRs and uh, net present values and things like that were critically important to them. Um, of late, I've had some people tell me, well, no, it's not, it, it's not our, our fault. Uh, you know, we've got a planning system imposed upon us by the provincial government, and we can't speed it up. Uh, there's nothing a, a local city can do to make things more efficient. Is the time period of approvals a problem? And if so, can cities help and solve it? Or is it just something we got to accept? Oh, we should certainly not accept it. Um, and no. Um, and, and I think that there were a lot of insights from from that CMHC stats can study, uh, and one of them, there are many, but one of them are is the very large difference in regulatory burden across Canada. Um, and, and to oversimplify, things seem to happen a lot faster in Edmonton than in Toronto, Vancouver. Uh, so if Edmonton can do it, why why can't Toronto or Vancouver do it? Um, I mean, maybe that's a little bit too simplistic, but but I, I I don't really agree with this. I mean, the data refute the argument that we can't do something better. So I, I think that's um, point one. But but there's there are huge issues of speed i mean I, maybe i should give your listeners just a sense of, of the magnitude so um we're hearing anecdotally in toronto that uh, going through the regulations to get rezoning is a matter of three years five years whatever uh in edmonton and it used to be in montreal it was less than two years so i mean and when the developers have to tie up their capital for this amount of time and obviously with high interest rates they might be better off parking their money in cash um the, these delays cost money and are they are quite critical so there are huge issues relating with time delay. Um, there are issues uh, also related to the costs and fees that are imposed, development charges, and a whole myriad of other studies and uh, regulations that, that cost money. And, and I think I, I'm, there's an increasing concern about the lack of alignment uh, across municipalities. So um, I'm at a conference now and looking at um, mass production of housing. And one of the feedback uh, that's given is, well, 
you have this uh, requirement in one municipality and that requirement in another municipality. So th there's no standardization across municipalities. And that obviously means you can't get economies of scale. Uh, you, you can't go into mass production when you have to custom build for every municipality. So th th there's a whole myriad of regulations, time, cost, complexity, uncertainty, risk. Uh, it's, it's just it's, it's making life very difficult. You know, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, involved in business and, and we have procedures um, in business. And, uh, and if things aren't working, you go and you take a look at those procedures and policies and you, and you try to improve upon them. You, you vet them, you, uh, you, uh, you test them and uh, you look for efficiency and effectiveness. Does government do that? You know, I'm, 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 I'm struck at how so many people in, in politics, in government sort of say, well, this is our process. And they never think about changing it. They don't think about the economic hit of it. What's what's your sense, sir? Um, I I think what I, I'll come back to your question in a minute. What would really, really, really help is just having more data on, on all of these processes. Like at the, at the moment uh, at CMHC and and Statistics Canada, we have data on building permits. Which is sort of interesting. It gives you a sense of some dimensions of time. But what's really quite opaque and unclear to us is the whole, um, the, what I will call development permitting. So if you have a piece of land, you make a request, can I rezone the land? Um, can, can I um, put different types of housing structures on the land? This sort of, but there's no data really on all of this activity, the, the development permit, how long it takes, it, it's really quite opaque. So what I would really advocate for are more data, more transparency on this whole development process. W what are the dates? What's the date of initial application? What's the date of the final permit being granted? Um, you're probably familiar with that old adage of what gets measured gets managed. And I, I think that's why having a lot more data in this area would allow um, uh, examination of the processes. Is it reasonable that these processes take X years well, and we don't you, really know what X is? Let, let me give you a practical uh, um, response to that, if I could. Uh, you know, I think it would be interesting to take a look at some of the uh, changes in as of right uh, zoning. Um, you know, BC, I think, within 400 meters of a major transit uh, zone uh, station and or just even a bus exchange says that the minimum amount of density that the cities have to uh, apply is 12 stories um, uh, versus, uh, you know, numerous places in uh, in the greater Toronto area that that would have dramatically less than that. You'd have to go for a rezoning application, uh, a ZBA, SBA. And that process, once you have to go through the rezoning, includes shadow studies, wind studies, archaeological studies, tree studies, floodplain studies, you know, a huge amount of, uh, of work. Um, that may be appropriate at, at certain uh, times, but once something is as of right uh, approved, uh, you don't have to do that. And so I think that having you know zoning catch up with where the market needs to be such that not every single developer on every single property has to go through the whole process such that, you know, I'm told not just by developers, but by city councillors, look, we're never going to be able to approve your project. We're never going to get it get through the process. Just appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal because you'll get what you want through that quasi-judicial Ontario Land tri Tribunal process that our planning system just can't can't adapt to and, and approve. Yes. Um, it, it's clear that there is something in, in the entire governance of the land approval process that needs a close look. I, I um, I agree, uh, and but we we have very limited data and transparency on that on that whole process, um, and, it, and it it requires a fundamental rethink. A fundamental rethink. Who's going to do that? Well, that's the problem. Well, you know, coming back to the optimistic slant, I mean, I, I think there is um, particular. I've detected over the last year an increased awareness that we are in a crisis in housing. I, I don't tend to use inflammatory language, but you know, word, I, crisis is not a word I normally use, but it, it's clear we have 
a crisis of housing for the middle class. We have a crisis of housing for low income and the homeless. Arguably, we have a crisis for indigenous peoples in the north. Um, so I, I think with greater awareness that we we have a crisis and um, the, the imperative for change is becoming more obvious. Now the problem is is um, it's a bit of a still a bit of a slow burn crisis. Uh, but if we were to have a global economic slowdown, not predicting it, but if we were to have a global economic uh, slowdown, then a crisis may be imposed on us. And in that case, we'd need to change in a hurry. I can't understand why we're not changing in a hurry already, but that's a different uh, factor. Let's talk about um, your comment about we need change at scale, if we could, for a minute. Uh, you know, there's been a whole bunch of attention to this uh, fourplex as of right that uh, the federal government's been trying to impose on municipalities uh, in this, uh, I don't even know whether we call it a bribe or an incentive, but uh, the uh, the infrastructure funds that, that if you don't adhere to what the federal government wants with approving fourplexes, you, uh, you won't get the infrastructure monies that they have promised. My understanding is CMHC doesn't actually give financing unless you've got five units or more um, because of the challenge associated with uh, you know, financing at scale. Um, I've heard, certainly heard from contractors that, you know, it's only the mom and pops that do uh, triplexes and duplexes and, and potentially quadplexes that big contractors need something larger to, to get involved in. Um, and that, uh, you know, banks are very reluctant to finance it. And so therefore the typical person that builds a triplex or a fourplex is, is you know, 50 to 75% equity, only 25 to 50% debt versus a far more substantial amount of debt one gets in a, in a typical situation. And that, you know, there's only been seriously dozens, not hundreds or thousands, but dozens of, uh, of triplexes and quadplexes built in Toronto and or Mississauga over time. And so therefore the idea of, you know, you can get that many in one story of one tower uh, units uh, built uh, is the challenge. What do you think? Are, is this fourplex issue really a solution or is it a is it an argument looking for a problem um i i don't think there's a silver bullet with respect to housing so i think everything helps um i think for example um there may be it may be helpful to have a dedicated program for student housing um it, it may have you know be small in the overall scheme of things but it helps uh, it, it may be that we need to dedicate a program for elderly housing um, to help them be in housing that's suitable for the, them, that doesn't involve stairs, etc., which may be a small program, but it, but it helps. Um, but I, I think I agree with the overall gist of your question is that we need, we need scale. Um, I, I've been at a few uh, conferences in Toronto recently where there have been international people coming in uh, and they're all expressing a bit of shock about the structure of Toronto in, in the sense that there's not a lot of high rises here. Um, people in Toronto may think there's a lot of condominiums, but relative to other countries, it's a pretty flat, sprawling city. Uh, and I think uh, much of the answer to supply at scale will be large scale um, apartment structures, rental or ownership. Uh, and this is people are building it on, on the condominium site, but on purpose built rental, um, this seems to be a problem in Toronto. Uh, the rate of construction of purpose built rental in Toronto is really low. Um, now that may be because of reliance on the condominiums, it's a, and there may be a little bit too much risk um, for the developers. But uh, we, we, the demand for rental is huge. The cost of ownership is so large that um, rental will have to be a major part of the solution, and and these need to be built at scale. So not four or five stories, but you know twenty, thirty, forty, and so forth. Um, as I said, we need to double housing starts, and the way to do that at scale is um, going vertical and trying to get better technologies, better economies of scale in doing that. You just said um, that we need 20, 30, 40. Uh, Toronto City Council last week approved six stories on major roads, which I think is good, but is that close to enough? 
Uh, I, probably not. Um, the, the way the economics of, of these projects usually works is, is that the uh, value of the structure is roughly four times the value of the land. And the value of the land in Toronto has gone up a lot, especially on those arterials. And, and so to, to, to make the building economics work, I, I think you need to go a lot higher. There is this appearance that height is, you know, this big boogeyman that people are worried about. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the, the city councillors and the planning departments and, and the neighborhoods that to, um, get involved complain about height. But yet almost every architect I've spoken with says that people don't notice height above six stories. Like they don't know whether it's six or 10 or 20 uh, or 40 or 60. They just, they, they don't see height that what's far more important to them is the, the street uh, and, and the vibrancy on the street. And if there's retail or restaurants or, or, you know, amenities or, or public places, why is height such a, a big boogeyman? I have to admit, I don't know. I, I, I may be speaking from my own book. My apartment is on the 27th floor, but um, I, I really don't get the problem. Um, the, the, you hear these short stories about shadows, etc., cetera, but um, weighing concern about shadows versus the housing crisis that we have, I, I think I'd put a lot more emphasis on, on the housing crisis because it, it, the, the housing crisis is generating all sorts of problems. It, it's having knock-on uh, impacts through the housing system and homelessness, um, lack of labor mobility, um, excessive debt. This is creating massive problems. Now is not the time to be worrying about shadows. Well, and, and even on shadows, if I could, I, I saw this one development where the FSI, the, the, the density of two different potential developments was exactly the same because that's what was approved by the city. One was uh, six stories high and the other one was 18 stories high. And the, the six story high one was like this big hulking bowling alley type structure uh, versus the tall slender 18 story and and the average price that they could get from the 18 story was far greater because people wanted height and views and stuff for it but on shadows the six story hulk completely shadowed the immediate neighbors for a very long period of time the 18 story that was tall and slender shadowed more people but for a very short length of time because the sun passed very quickly by this tall slender building so from a societal equity standpoint, the actual tall one was more equitable. It shared the shadow amongst more people for a far shorter period of time versus what city council and the planners were looking for really negatively impacted uh, more people, less people, but for a far greater amount of time. I, I agree. There are a lot of complicated issues in this area. So for example, Montreal tends to have more of that six story stuff um, but that has been built up over many decades, but it has resulted in Montreal being relatively high density. Um, even though they don't have the towers of Toronto and Vancouver, the fact that they have these six stories um, does lead them to have a lot of density. But, but Montreal has built that up over decades. And I, I don't think we have the time um, to build all of that density. Now, we, we, we need to move fast. So scale. let me ask you about that, if I could, because, you know, the provincial government in Ontario has been talking about coming out with a major transit station area policy for seemingly more than a year, um, which would increase density in close proximity to major transit zones. Excuse me, they've been talking about 800 meters. B.C., has already come out with someone within 400 meters where the minimum density is 12 stories. Is that kind of change having an impact in BC and should it be implemented in Ontario, do you think? I, I, getting more density of transport seems to be the low hanging fruit. Uh, I, the, the numbers in BC seem low to me. Now in BC, uh, the, there has been a lot of density going in through through the um, the transit lines around Metro Town, for example. So th there's been a lot of density in that area. Uh, but but then there are other places. And thinking of Ottawa, where you have transit stations on the new um, train in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, uh, but the given that there's a transport uh, transport station there. Uh, there's some social acceptance of infrastructure there. Uh, the low-hanging fruit seems to have a, be 
to have a lot of housing there as well and a lot of units and, and really go up high. Um, I mean, you, you go to some East Asian cities and the, the transit stations, they go, go Bangkok going 40, 50 stories around the stations. And if, if I understood it correctly, it was the developer of the, um, the high rises there that paid for the station. So the, the, there are ways of doing this and getting a lot of density at these stations. And Well, you know, I'll give the, you a, a few examples if I could. Uh, so the Vaughn Metro Center uh, is at the, you know, the end of the terminus of the the extension of that university line subway station. And there's 40, 50, 60 story towers. Uh, yep. And it's created a huge amount of uh, property tax benefit for Vaughn right. and, and such that they're, they're building a wonderful, you know, new downtown, effectively a new city hall, a living arts center, you know, a whole bunch of uh, stuff. Uh, they're talking about extending the young street subway North uh, uh, from Finch to Steeles and even to Richmond Hill. And you've got this competition now almost between Toronto and Vaughn at young and Steeles where uh, Toronto is uh, approving 50 story towers and Vaughn's permitting 60 story towers. Um, and one of the benefits is it's uh, an old regional shopping center. So there's less neighborhood neighbors that can complain, but you're building density there. And, and similarly in Richmond Hill, they've got all day two way go going into Markham. And one of the reasons why is they've got this new downtown of Markham that's got 40 and 50 story towers in Mississauga. They've been talking about um, all day two-way go um, and at Dixie um, Station uh, and maybe even potentially an extension of the subway to Dixie. There was an environmental study done there. And the cap is 12 and 25 stories, 25 stories at uh, at Dixie Road and one block in 12 stories, which is actually closer to, uh, to the go train station and where the subway station would be if it was ever extended. And it's it's like, to me, naive to think that with 12 and 25 stories, you're ever going to get provincial governments to invest in higher order transit when Vaughn's doing 50, when Markham's doing 40 and 50, and when Toronto and Vaughn on Young are doing 50 and 60 stories. So you're going to get that housing at scale built right next to a, a transit expansion. And if the alternative is spending the money in Mississauga and all you're doing is approving 12, you're never going to get the money. And it doesn't make economic sense for the province to give you the money. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're not wrong. I mean, the, the, this is the basic financing game. When you have those massive um, tall towers by the train station, you get the riders for the transit and, and it makes the, the, the subway system financially viable. So, uh, I mean, if you have stations in the middle of nowhere or with low density housing, the, the station doesn't pay off. So it's not a, it's not just a question of getting um, more housing built where it, you have some degree of acceptability of it getting built, but it also makes the transit more financially feasible. And you so don't have I, to build these massive uh, structured parking lots. Yes, uh, and, and you, as a result of having so many people in these locations, you get a lot of other amenities built as well. So restaurants, cinemas, bowling alleys, whatever. So there's a whole new um, area of benefits that, that, that's being generating there. So uh, and, and in order to make all of this pay off, you need scale in housing and people and, and in financial capacity. I think this this scale is a big issue that we need to talk about. Let's take a break for some messages, and we're going to come back, and I'm going to challenge uh, our uh, our expert with a couple of issues in regards to scale. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Aled Ab Irwath, the Deputy Chief Economist at uh, CMHC, is my guest uh, tonight, and we're talking about housing and the housing crisis, and we've been uh, discussing a lot of issues associated with regulation and how that slows down uh, the potential development and uh, costs money for uh, developers. And in that regard, Aled, I've, I've talked to a couple of banks recently in regards to their land loans. And they've commented to me that almost everything is on hold. And the reason why it's on hold is uh, several factors that, uh, that because of the concern about the pre-construction condo market going down by 71%, um, the uh, the developers aren't able to market. And they've pointed to a couple of developments downtown Toronto that have recently come out to the market where instead of selling you know, 50, 60, 70% of the units, they're selling like 10% of their units. And so the market has come down dramatically. And some of that is that, uh, that a lot of those typical investors that would have come and invested in the past um, are getting assignment 
uh, you know, they are trying to do assignment sales on the pre-construction condos that they invested in a couple of years ago because of uh, the, 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 the challenges in regards to not only high interest rates, but the stress tests that they have to pass that mean that the interest rates that they've got to be able to afford are, are even higher than they actually uh, would end up uh, affording on their uh, mortgage uh, approvals, that um, lots of people are just worried. They're worried about price declines. They're worried about regulations. They're worried about the economy. Um, they're worried about out-migration. They're worried about a whole bunch of other things, such that people are telling me, these bankers have got land loan books that are full and they're not being brought down because the, the, the big developers aren't taking them from the land loan book into the construction side of things. And so therefore they've got no room left for new opportunities. And so therefore people that are looking for new opportunities can't get the financing, not that CMHC is offering, but they need from a bank before they get that CMHC approval. And so nothing's happened. It's like you've got sand in the wheels and everything's cranking to a halt. And I've heard this over and over again, that, that the market is seizing up. What do you think, sir? Is that real or not? Uh, it, it, we're not really seeing it in the data yet, but the, the data is lagged. Um, so for example, uh, at CMHC, we have data on housing starts, but but that's really quite late in the development process. So it, it doesn't cover everything that you talked about, about getting development financing uh, and the rest of it. Uh, and uh, all of this financing has to occur before uh, we, we get to the start. So and that's a little bit my concern that we, we, the end of this year, we think we're going to see a, um, a, a substantial fall in starts. But 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 that's at the tail end of all all of these problems, so um, that have been brought about by basically by high interest rates, uh, and th this is a little bit of a um, phenomena that that we repeatedly see in housing, uh, in supply constrained cities. So interest rates go up, housing starts um, fall off rapidly. Um, the economy recovers, everybody piles into housing and the house prices go up, but the supply is not there. And, and so it becomes a very uh, volatile system with uh, a lot of debt and, and crises. Uh, so rather than having a constant uh, supply of housing over the years, it, it, it ends up being a lot more volatile because the housing system can't respond rapidly to changing demand conditions, partly because of the regulatory structure. So um, I, 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 like I said, I tend to have to rely heavily on data, uh, um, but the anecdotes I'm hearing are, are along the lines uh, that you've been pointing out. Uh, I'm also hearing that on the construction side, some of the um, skilled trades are underemployed at the moment. Uh, because the those um, some of the initial work has been delayed, and so a year or two ago we were concerned about the uh, skill shortages. Now some of those are a little bit underemployed. But then coming back to my mantra that we need scale, uh, we need those workers to be fully employed uh, and producing as much as possible. So there's there's a mismatch between the current slowdown on the amount of housing that we need. So I'm told that uh, most of the finishing trades are fully at work, um, finishing things that were started, you know, 18 months, two years ago, but that excavators have yeah. got almost no, uh, you know, book yeah. um, so that they're almost desperate now for jobs. Um, and, yeah. and that would suggest to me that, you know, it's the things that are we're expecting to be supplied in 18 months that are going to be the big, big problem because the excavators yeah. aren't excavating right now. Yeah, I agree. And um, we, we've already seen the slowdown in single detached housing, townhousing, the small structures. Uh, and because Montreal tends to have a lot of that sort of structure, we've also seen a big slowdown in, in housing starts in Montreal. Um, in contrast, in, in Toronto and Vancouver, where we tend to see more high rises, not enough, but we do tend to see more high rises. Um, we think the starts are at the point of um, turning over at the moment because of the um, slowdown in those large structures. 
You mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago development fees, and I wonder if you could address whether development fees are an issue or not, whether they're a regressive tax or whether there's something that you need to uh, <clears throat> charge. Uh, and and the reason why I ask this is that uh, Mississauga's got some of the highest development fees. And for some reason, they don't think that's a problem. I, I was in a different municipality recently where they said, number one, um, we are going to reduce development fees for developments either under a certain size or below a certain value. And we want to have some of the lowest development fees, because we think from a competitive standpoint, that will mean that more people want to come and build in our municipality. What do you think the impact of development fees are and what could municipalities do or should do in regards to development fees? Well, my starting point is that um, there's a question of who pays the development fees. And, and the economists have drawn this distinction between who hands over the cash for a fee and who actually bears the burden, who who faces a real cost uh, from from the fees. Now, with development fees, yes, it's the developers and the builders who pay the cash uh, over to the municipality for the fees. But I think most economists would argue that, yes, the, we know who pays the cash, but it, 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 what generally happens is that the developers and the builders will raise the cost of the home being built to the buyers. And, and therefore, uh, it's those buyers that effectively bear the burden of, of these development fees. So just I'm not, to, to lay out the chain, yes, it's the, the developers that pay the cash for the development fees, uh, but it's the buyers that bear the burden, the financial cost of those fees, because they pay, have to pay um, a higher price. The, the developers just pass the development fees over to whoever buys the house. So in, in that case, a development fee is effectively a tax on uh, buyers of new structures. And if you tax buyers of new structures, uh, there is less demand for new structures and therefore you get less new structures. Um, sort of w w once you draw the distinction of who pays the development fees, the, the economic impact is relatively clear. And, and yet at the same time, politician after politician says it's rich developers that pay the development fees and they're so wrong. It, it's yes. just astounding to me that they, you know, you know, you can lay out so clearly what ends up happening uh, and that it gets passed on to young people, to newcomers, to renters that right. want to get into the home uh, ownership business. It's, a, I think, one of the most regressive taxes we've got in our in our society. And yet naive politicians over and over and over again say, well, it's the rich developers that end up paying those fees. Yeah, this is clearly incorrect. And I've been even hearing cases these days that builders of social housing have, have huge development fees. And um, now that there are policies in Vancouver, I think, where rental structures are waived development fees or some of the fees at least. So, um, but it should be really clear that development fees are effectively paid by whoever buys the property, not by the builder of the property. Uh, and these development fees, um, I'm not sure I'm up to date, but but they are of the order of $100,000 or more, and more. Uh, these these are not, you know, s simple, small taxes. And if there's any negotiation or um, around them, then that increases the complexity and the uncertainty even more. So could municipalities do something about this? Should they do something about this? Well, well, to the best of their ability, yes. Uh, now, this is where the things get a little bit more complicated. Um, I, I This is where I think the province and the federal government needs to take a closer look. Um, is, are there funds from higher orders of government that could be used to pay for local infrastructure? With the proviso that in, in, if that is the case, those development fees are reduced. Now, in general, this is the model that Quebec used to have. Uh, Quebec, going back a few years, had a policy that they wanted to increase the population growth of the province. In order to do that, they recognized they need more housing. And in order to do that, they needed, because of this provincial imperative, they would support a lot more local infrastructure. And therefore, development fees in Quebec used to be extremely low. Now, yes, Quebec had higher income taxes, higher sales taxes, but they did have a lot lower housing costs. In uh, in the United States, it's different as well. Maybe you uh, can educate us on this. Uh, I'm uh, developing some products, uh, some some projects in the United States, and there. What one typically does is they, you raise money 
um, municipal tax bonds um, to finance the infrastructure. And these are, you know, 25 to 40 year uh, debts. Um, and instead of therefore raising all the money up front for the cost of uh, infrastructure, you effectively finance it and amortize it over 24, 25 to 40 years. And, and you charge the development an increased property tax or development charge every year, but rather than up front over 25 to 40 years. Does that make sense as far as financing infrastructure? I, I think this whole area needs to um, be examined very closely. Um, what you suggested uh, makes sense. Um, the Quebec model of higher, having um, higher taxes, higher general taxes across the province to pay the, for this makes sense. Um, but the, this whole municipal finance um, of infrastructure, I, I think, is an area that it, I, I'm more and more convinced that the whole problem in housing is tied to this area and the lack of clarity over who is paying for what. Um, so another alternative may be to have um, better pricing of water, um, but that has its own political risks. But, but if, if households were um, paying much more for water, um, that would, and, and the funds from that used to pay for infrastructure, maybe that would lead to more efficient water use, but, but that's a political hot potato probably. But, but the, the, at the moment, this entire effort of putting um, the burden of infrastructure on new home buyers um, is clogging up the housing system. Well, and and you end up with some ludicrous results. I understand. I think you're in Ottawa that uh, you know development fees in the municipality of Ottawa are twice uh, what development fees are some of the neighboring communities around Ottawa, and yet. In Ottawa, you would be doing infill development, so therefore the actual cost of infrastructure should be dramatically less, and the cost of the infrastructure in those communities outside, because it's going to be suburban sprawl, would be dramatically right. more, but the development fees go the opposite direction. So yeah. you end up having this ludicrous result, and, and we're incentivizing the highest cost development with the lowest development fees rather than you know, doing what we should be doing, which was providing the incentive to people and to developers to develop where the infrastructure cost is the lowest. Right. And it, it, this brings in several dimensions. So in a lot of uh, industrial lands like Queen's Key and close to the lakeshore in Toronto, it's, it's a lot of industrial land. Now, the issue is there's a lot of infrastructure already in there. So if you were to convert some of that industrial land into uh, housing, the infrastructure cost is probably not that big because you already have a lot of infrastructure in place. You may need to make the pipes bigger, but still, you know, you already have the right of way and all of, all of, all of the required permits are probably in place. So the there is an option of doing housing there with lower infrastructure costs and therefore lower development fees. But, you, but your case in Ottawa also brings up, um, so to repeat uh, the example, is the structure of the development fees is effectively promoting sprawl. And that's why, again, you mentioned the US. I think in Phoenix, they have a... Uh, structure of development fees in place where it increases with distance from the city of center. So it discourages sprawl. And that's because Phoenix um, can can do can design the development fee structure for over its entire metro area and discourage sprawl. And obviously water is a major issue in the um in the desert there. God, a whole metro area actually working together. What an incredibly interesting idea. I wish it could happen in uh in uh, the greater Toronto area. Uh, Aled, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's our uh, conversation with Aled uh, Ab Irawath, the Deputy Chief Economist at CMHC. We're going to take a break, and I'm going to come back with a couple of my own personal comments on this issue in just two minutes. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two.